We've been working through uh, 1 Peter. Last week we talked about our responsibilities on earth. Uh, Today our responsibilities at home. And uh, it is so timely. People say, is the Bible applicable? And the answer is 100%. It applies. And so today, remember the letter, uh, and and don't get upset with me, I'm just the messenger, right? But the letter was written by Peter to the church. And it was written many years ago, and and yet it sounds like it's written for today. So let me start with just by way of introduction, a couple of things. Looking back at the the recent changes in our nation and in society, in I did this a while back with different illustrations. I want to use some uh, some new ones today and just kind of show you this same thing. And I, again, I'm just working my way through 1 Peter. We just happened to get today to 1 Peter chapter 3. So here it goes. It was in 2008, the family issue analysts at Focus on the Family wrote this. 2008, battered by high rates of divorce and cohabitation, unwed childbearing and the push for so-called same-sex marriage in quotes and civil unions marriage is in a state of crisis recent cultural changes without historical precedent have influenced an increasing number of americans to view this fundamental institution as optional disposable and open to redefinition in this context of marital decline, this is 2008, political and ideological battles rage between those who view marriage as transient, as a transient human invention, ready for updating and revision, and those who regard marriage as natural and fundamental to humanity, essential to a flourishing civilization. Now that was written in 2008. And you see the progress that's been made and where we are since that. That's just 15 years ago. Let me give you some other things that have taken place. In July 2012, Chick-fil-A came under attack simply because their president, Dan Cathy, stated his support for traditional marriage. In 2012, at that time, then-Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel denounced Dan Cathy's pro-traditional marriage stance and said, Chick-fil-A's values are not Chicago's values. Then Boston Mayor Thomas uh, Menino told Chick-fil-A they were not welcome to do business in Boston. And New York Governor at that time, Elliot Spitzer, which if you know anything about the news there, uh, he was a winner, uh, called for a boycott of Chick-fil-A. Now, when you look at all these things and you look at at the position, why was Chick-fil-A attacked? Because of their view of traditional marriage. Where did traditional marriage, the idea, come from? From the courthouse? No. Was it made up in somebody's mind? No. Where did it come from? From the mind and the heart of God. It's a biblical value. When we talk about marriage, when we begin to put that out there and have these conversations, again, these are not political conversations. Don't buy the lie. When we have these conversations, there are people that say, Pastor, you get too political. And I got to tell you, the idea of marriage is not a political issue. The idea of marriage is a biblical issue. And so when I tell you in 2008 that Focus on the Family was starting to see some of these things happening, and in 2012, a business is boycotted nationwide because, and I just gave you a few illustrations, but they're boycotted because of their view and expression of support for traditional marriage. Uh, this, is, this is real life stuff. You say, did it stop there? No. How about March 2013? At the annual Starbucks shareholders meeting in Seattle, Washington, Starbucks company officials told those who support biblical marriage that they can sell their shares in Starbucks and buy shares in another company. You say, really? Yep, those of you that love Starbucks, there you go. Listen, that, wh- why would they say that? Did you catch the quote? And that's in quotes. Those that support traditional marriage. Traditional marriage is under attack. Wait, wait a second, where did we say traditional marriage came from? The Bible, it's not political, it's biblical. And it goes on, Hobby Lobby. I know they get, get in the news all the time. They've been targeted repeatedly through the years for their traditional values, including their view on traditional marriage. 
December 12th, though, 2021, or 2022, excuse me, uh, the government passed the Respect for Marriage Act, and it, it sounds good. Respect for marriage, that's good. But it establishes that a marriage is considered valid under federal law if it was legal in the state where it was performed. Basically, it forces acceptance of any kind of marriage, anything that someone would call marriage, as long as the state calls it legal. Now, I just gave you in a nutshell from 2008 to 2023. In 15 years, have you seen the progress? No, I haven't seen progress. I've seen a progressive movement toward a, an agenda, but I've not seen progress. What I've seen is that we we're moving further and further and further, further from the biblical view of marriage. And again, these, this is not politics. Those of you that are saying, Pastor, I wish you'd get off the polit- political things. Again, we're, we're remaining silent and allowing biblical values to be washed out. If the church doesn't stand up and speak for what's important and what's biblical, then who will? It's on us. Not to be uh, people that are out there that are causing problems, but but people that will at least stand up and say, this is what the Bible teaches. This is why I, I believe this way and I get this. So the world's definition of marriage may have changed. But enough by way of introduction, let me just tell you this. God's view has not. Okay, God's view of marriage has not change. And so his, his idea on marriage, when we look at it, a biblical marriage is a picture of Christ's love for his church. When you put those two things together, now you understand why Satan hates marriage. Now you understand why culture is attacking marriage. You say, no, uh, uh, they just want different things. No, it all comes back to this picture of Christ in his church. And if Satan can destroy the picture of Christ's love in his church, the symbol of God and everything that he loves about his church, if he can do that, then he wins. Or at least one little battle along the way, right? And so that's why we as believers have to understand the importance, the significance of marriage. And that's why Peter addresses it. Peter says, listen, here's the, the the recipe for a happy home. And he lays it out there. So let's start. He starts by giving some instructions here to wives, and then he goes to husbands, and then we conclude with couples. So let's move through 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start with Peter's instructions to the wives. Ladies first, right? I know the men are going, why are you doing this? Because that's the order he put it in. Here we go. All right, so first, ladies, examine your actions. Say, preacher, now you're meddling. I'm just the messenger, okay? Peter said it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive. There's that stinking word. I know, some of you, I just lost you. Be submissive to your own husbands. Why? Don't miss the why. That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So the key word here is conduct. The key word is, ladies, your your actions, your conduct is so critical to your testimony. Your conduct is critical to your testimony. Listen to this. Your conduct is not based on your husband's behavior. Some of us behave badly. And I'm not going to throw you guys under the bus. I'll crawl under it with you. Some of us behave badly. There are days we get up on the wrong side of the bed. We don't act like we should. And listen, if your wife retaliates, Uh, Again, she should not be governed by the behavior of the husband. Wives, take note there. Listen, your godly behavior, though, should be in such a way and consistent enough that the unbelieving husband might actually be won by your behavior. When you look at this, there there are a lot of other principles here as well. But uh, some people, we don't talk about it a lot, so I want to I talk about it a little bit this morning. Just pause here for a minute. The Bible's very clear that we're not to be unequally yoked. The believers should not marry unbelievers, okay? So if you're one of our teenagers, single adults, college age, whatever, you're looking at dating somebody, let me just give you the starting point. A Christian should not date a non-Christian. If, if they're not saved, you have no business dating them. There's this idea of missionary dating. Well, maybe if I start dating them, I'll bring them to Jesus. That never works, okay? Doesn't work. Great idea. Theory's good. Don't waste your time because if you're doing that, it's it's unbiblical, all right? You say, Pastor, that sounds kind of cultish. 
Uh, no, it's not a cultish thing. It's God's plan because God desires the best for you. And it goes back to Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden. He puts it all together. He tells them to multiply, to make image bearers, to make disciples. Disciple making starts in the home. So if you're married to an unbeliever and you having these children and you're not raising them to know Christ and they're not image bearers and you're battling over are we taking them to church or are we not what holidays are we celebrating what are we not and you're you're putting all that confusion into your home you're bringing in things that don't need to be there the whole purpose of marriage and procreation is to create image bearers to multiply and fill the earth that's what God's plan was and that starts at home and so you look at all the other things, tie all that together. If that's God's plan and somebody's unfaithful and steps out of their marriage, what's happening? You're breaking God's plan. Now, we can, we can start to name sins and do all that, but when we go back to the whys, why is this so important? Because it violates God's plan. It's disobedience to God's plan. That's where we keep coming back to today. So this idea, ladies, of, of watching your actions, examining your actions, watching your conduct. If you're married to an unbeliever, I'm not telling you today to divorce that person. That is not in any way, shape, or form what I'm saying. Because what Peter's writing here is that if you are married to an unbeliever, that your conduct might actually bring them to know Christ because they watch the consistency of your faith. So that's the question, are you acting like a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you living in such a way that it would bring glory to God? This key word of submission that he talks about is not weakness. Submission is not the obedience part that some people get that confused with. Submission is not weakness. Submission is not fear. Submission is, is truly a, a person who's innerly, inwardly very secure. It's a person who is, I would call it voluntary unselfishness to where you're lining up under somebody and working with them. A, a cooperative spirit would be another way to say it. It's, uh, ladies, have a cooperative spirit with your husband. All right, this submission idea, uh, voluntarily, unselfishly, follow them as they follow Christ. That's what it's talking about. Let's move to the next one. Not only examine your actions, watch your conduct, but watch your adornment. Adornment is kind of an, an older word, but 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Now, let me read it out of the New Living Translation. It says this, don't be concerned about your outward beauty. Okay, that's adornment. Don't be concerned about your outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. Now, that's the apparel, the clothing. Hang on a minute. We live in South Florida. I don't even want to know what some of you pay to get your hair done, all right? <laughs> or nails. Man, I see different nails coming in all the time, and it's like they're beautiful. I can't imagine what people pay for all this stuff. And we live in South Florida. I mean, you go, okay, is that real? Is that not real? Is that real? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, you just see it all around us. But the whole principle here with the adornment is this. Don't miss this word. You ready? Modesty. Modesty. You say, preacher, we live in South Florida. That's not a real, real popular word here. But it's, it, it's what Peter's teaching the church. Modesty is this. It's clothing that keeps the eyes of the opposite sex focused on your face. If you're wearing something that causes them not to focus in your eyes and on your face, it's immodest. You say, well, well wait, I, I've been in those churches where they measure the length of the skirts. Now, that's legalism. Okay, uh, I've been in there where they, they measure the head. Wait a minute. There, there are rules. There are educational and institutional standards. We get that. But there was a day where people would actually pull out rulers and measure things. And I'm telling you, the Bible doesn't teach that. What it teaches is that whatever we have, it should keep the person focused on our face. If a lady walks up to you and, ladies, what you're wearing causes a man, instead of looking you in the eyes, to look here while they're trying, your eyes are up here, it's not modest, okay? It's that simple. I'm not even going to go into it any deeper because that's all this means. Make sure that the clothing is, is modest. The tight-fitting clothes that leave nothing to the imagination are probably not modest. You go to the beach. I won't tell you what we call it, but, but I'll give you an idea. If, if it looks like somebody's flossing in the wrong place, <laughs> that's not modest, okay? And I know we live in a culture where 
where there are people from all around the world that are bringing their cultures with them. I just got to tell you, the biblical idea of modesty does not change from culture to culture. All right? Understand that. You say, yeah, but in our country, it's this way. But I'm telling you that biblical absolutes, biblical standards don't change from culture to culture, place to place. That's when it, it becomes a person that's just putting opinions in, saying, in our, well, in our culture, this is our opinion. Now, wait a minute, but let's measure our opinions by Scripture. That's one of our core values. The Bible has the final authority. Uh, we have to be careful as you, you come into church, you know, and, and it's crazy, but it's a great passage to be able to mention some of this stuff. You know, we're never going to turn anybody away, but somebody comes in the door and, man, it's, ladies, you know, be careful what you're wearing at church. You're there, and a lot of times the, the um, uh, the styles would be way off the shoulders, open back, and you got a guy sitting behind you in church trying to worship, and you're flashing him. You know, it's like you just got to think about some of these things. Hey, preacher, this, this sounds kind of archaic. Hey, it's Peter. I'm just the messenger, all right? It gives the opportunity just to mention some things along the way, right? Um, I would summarize it this way. If you're not selling then stop advertising, okay? It's a good, good way to say it. Now, you can be attractive without being worldly. And, and uh, men, let me, let me just add in a little bit here. Guys, if you're the husband, protect your wife. If she's walking out the door in a way that you know that you would, you would look at somebody else and go, hmm, you, you, got, you, you probably shouldn't wear that. Dads, if your daughter's walking out of that, there, there were conversations, my daughters will tell you, there were days they did not like me. Oh, they loved me, but they didn't like me. But it's like, you're not wearing that. I'm a red-blooded man, and I know that that would definitely distract me. You are not wearing that out of the house. Why? Because I love you. And you say, my dad hates me. I hate him. Yeah, you'll get past all that. One day you're going to go, Dad, thank you. It'll happen. So hang in there. Now, uh, you know, as you start thinking about all this, uh, basically, bottom line, your clothes affect your witness. They really do. It, it impacts your witness. Ask this, would your clothing hinder your effectiveness in sharing the gospel with someone else? If what you're wearing would hinder their listening, then it's probably not the best thing. Without getting real legalistic in the conversation, I'm not saying it makes you any more spiritual. I'm saying it hinders their listening and hearing when we're not dressed right. Here's another one. Got through that one. Analyze your attitude. Analyze your attitude. You say, what? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Rather than let it be hidden, uh, let it be the hidden person of the heart, the beauty within, he continues here, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And the, the key word here, if I had to put one, I'd say the mindset. The mindset. Understanding this, that outward beauty is only temporary, and it's attractive to the world. But inward beauty is eternal, and it's attractive to God. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So you start to, you say, preacher, you're talking about clothing. You're talking about uh, the outward beauty, inward beauty, all this stuff. So let me, let me just, just make sure I clear this up real quick, okay? I am not encouraging the ladies here at Grace to stop fixing your hair, to stop using makeup, to, to stop dressing fashionably. We're not trying to have a congregation full of ugly people, Okay. I just want you to rest assured that is not my goal today. And there, but there are some denominations and religions that do that. You know, taboo on the makeup, taboo on the hair, taboo on the styles. I, I get it. I'm not encouraging you to do that today. But just remember this. Uh, I, I've always said it. I mean, for decades, I've used the same phrase. It just goes like this. If the barn needs painting, paint it. Okay? How about that? We just leave it right there. We don't want a church of, full of ugly people, men or women. You just, you just work on it. As God made you, we accept you. And if you need a little touch-up in the morning, how many of you looked in the mirror this morning? Every hand in the building should be up, <laughs> okay? All right? If not, there are two beautiful mirrors as you go into the restrooms now on each side. Just take a look before you come in the auditorium. You want to know, is your hair right? Is there something hanging out of your nose? Do you still have the lines from your mask? All these different things. You want to know. And we want you to fix them before you come in, okay? So understand what Peter's saying. We can get so hung up, especially in a culture like ours, in, in a place where uh, nations of the world gather, 
in a place where it's always sunny outside and we are so close to the beach, it's easy to focus on the temporal things. It's easy to focus on the outward things. And God is saying, focus on the heart, the gentle, quiet spirit. Focus on the godly character. And then evaluate your attention. Look at verses 5 and 6. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid of any uh, terror. Now, in the NLT, again, New Living Translation, it says in verse 5, This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. It was a focus, just a focus thing. They honored. That term reveals this. Sarah respected Abraham. She had a cooperative spirit with him. She met his needs as well as her own. That's what this is talking about when she called him her Lord or Master. That's a small L, by the way, okay? So now listen, in, in our house, I'm glad my wife cooks for me or I would starve to death. I, I just confess to you, I need that. I'm glad she has a gentle spirit because sometimes I don't. And I'm glad we're partners in this thing called marriage because she puts her focus on God first. That's the way that happens in a house. When the wives have the right focus so ladies let me just kind of wrap up your section and ask it like this where's your focus is it on all the outward things that's really what peter's asking today is your focus on the outward appearance is your focus on the temporary things is your focus on impressing others or is your focus on god and as you focus on god then your attention is proper on your husband where that needs to be so ladies who do you spend the most time with you spend time with your your husband? Are you engaged in activities that uh, both you and your spouse enjoy? I've watched young couples that, uh, to me, one of the sure signs is they get married and he goes and does her things. She goes and does her, uh, he's doing his, she's doing hers, and they don't see each other. They're in different worlds. Find some things you can do together. Work on those things. Whose needs are you usually trying to meet? Yours or the family? Is a spouse at the top of your prayer list? These are important questions. So then Peter moves on, and he gives the instructions to husbands. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm kind of nervous going through that first section myself this morning. Okay, so now it's instructions to the husband. Now, if you'll notice, Peter gave more instructions to the wives than he did the husbands. Okay, a little shorter section here. Someone actually pointed out to me this week it's because men can only focus on one thing at a time. But women can multitask. I, I learned that this week. All right? So here you go, guys. We're going to keep this simple. He says in chapter seven, or verse 7, the first part, he says, uh, Husbands, likewise, dwell with your wife. He says, dwell with your wife. Okay, you go, hey, I can do that. Live with my wife. We're good. Well, the NLT says it a little bit clearer. It says, honor your wives. That goes beyond dwelling or just living in the same house. It means to give respect to give great esteem. Hey, husbands, did you hear that? The wife may have had a few more things on her list, but the husband has some things that are pretty important. Give respect. Give great esteem to that person. Put her above your hobbies. You say, now, preacher, you're meddling. We've been going on this thing to where, you know, she's already getting on me because I like to go play pickleball or golf or basketball or, you know, I like to be out doing this, and she says I don't spend enough time. Well, you better listen, okay? It's one of those things. Who's first? Family or hobbies? Show her respect. Hey, men, do you know your, your sons are watching you? They're watching how you treat your wife. Your daughters. Men, you got a daughter? She's watching how to measure the man she's going to date and ultimately marry based on how you treat her. Do you open and hold the door for her? You say, preacher, again, it's so old-fashioned. I do it for my wife. You, do you go through the door first? <laughs> you open the door. Yeah, I'll hold the door for you. I'm going first, and by the way, come on in, and you hold it behind you. No, that's not how that goes. <laughs> Do you still exercise chivalry? You say, that's an archaic word. Yeah, but it's not dead, as they say. Your young men are watching how you treat a lady, and your daughters are watching how they should be treated. And all of that comes by the way that you treat your wife, men. 
Do you value her opinions and her insights? You know, there are times, my wife is a great judge of character. And, he, and here's the bottom line. If she tells me, don't trust you, <laughs> I don't trust you. Because here's the thing. I've learned through the years, I'll give somebody the benefit of the doubt and go, oh, yeah, yeah. And she goes, they got something, they got another alternative. There's a motive there. I don't like that person. And without question, she's right. It's the weirdest thing, but it's a gift. I've learned. There's an insight I need to value. What about the opinions? Being honest with her, keeping your promises. Listen, if you don't treat her right, somebody else will. Remember that. She's your life partner, not your property. Another good quote. Here's the next one. Peter says, to know your wife. The next part of verse 7. I love this in the Amplified Version. It says it this way. In the same way, you husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way with great gentleness and tact and with an intelligent regard for the marriage relationship. It's like he knows us men as well. He says, with an intelligent regard. <laughs> All right, and he stresses that. And then in the New King James, it just simply says, with understanding. But it means this, a deep understanding of how she's put together. Do you know her favorite color, her flower, her favorite song, favorite perfume? And just so you know, I sat on the couch this morning and looked at my wife and said, I'm preaching on this. Let me make sure I got this right. <laughs> and she said, you don't need to tell everybody what all my favorites are. And it was like, no, I'm not going to tell them. I just want to make sure that when I get to this point, I'm actually preaching with integrity and I'm not going, yeah, I don't know that either. <laughs> So we went through them, and I got most of them right. I missed this favorite song. She's not a big music person. But other than that, and, uh, you know, it's, listen, you should know those things. It means eating together, working together. It means serving together. There's no greater way to build a good, solid marriage than serving the Lord together. When we started dating, our dates consisted of us and about 40 teenagers. Because I was a youth pastor, and she'd come along on the dates. And so our dates were with a bunch of kids most of the time. In fact, we just had a reunion not long ago with our very first youth group. And one of the guys said, yeah, I remember that. He remembered tagging along or watching us in the store. Here's the case in point, lesson to be learned. I remember watching you. And so here's a kid that was in our youth group saying, yeah, I remember back then watching you and your wife, how you acted when you didn't think anybody was watching. And these are all important things. Great place to start. Men, when you're trying to understand your wife and know your wife, her love language. If you don't know that, that's a great place to start. And then he says, let her see here, honor your wife. Again, verse 7, giving honor to the wife is to the weaker vessel. You say, I knew he'd throw that in there. She's the weaker vessel. Uh, not in every relationship physically, but in some. But you know what he's saying? You should protect her. She was designed so that you are leading your home, protecting your wife. Had Adam done a little bit better job, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in, let's be honest. It's said that right there at the tree, Eve ate of the fruit and gave some to her husband who was with her. Read that verse. He was there. He didn't do a very good job in protecting his home spiritually. Men, a call to action this morning. Let me read you this quick excerpt. In the book, The Gift of Honor, Gary Smalley and John Trent, two of my favorite authors, they write this. In ancient writings, something of honor was something of substance, valuable, costly, even priceless. For Homer, the Greek scholar, the greater the cost of the gift, the more the honor. Not only does it signify something or someone who is a priceless treasure, but it is also used for someone who occupies a highly respected position in our lives, someone high on our priority list. And that should be our wife, man. Finally, Peter wraps it up like this. All right, made it through the women's section. Whew, made it through the men's section. Hopefully it didn't upset too many of you. But he gets to the couple section, and he wraps it up, the last part of verse 7. Look what he says. And it's being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Heirs. That means both of you are children of God. That means you're loved equally by God, both bought with the blood of Christ. That means that as we're serving him, we're serving at an equal level. Now, as you understand that, 
you realize that we're partners in this thing called life, partners in this, this marriage. There's a lot of confusion about that in this day and age. And God's plan has not changed. It's still one man, one woman for a lifetime. You say, preacher, it's not popular. I know, but it's biblical. And again, back to where we started, this morning we're talking about traditional biblical marriage. It's where it originated. Marriage isn't uh, an idea of politics. Marriage isn't the idea of at a courthouse. Marriage wasn't the idea by just two people. God designed it. And so when you go back, uh, again, not, not being hateful, not being hurtful, not trying to cause division or harm, we just say that God's plan is the best plan. And so when we go back to that and, and we begin to realize that we have a partner, we have a spouse who is, is not property, but is involved in partnership, doing this thing of life. And look what, look what Peter says. This is critical here when you see it. That your prayers may not be hindered. You realize when your relationship with your spouse isn't right, your prayers are hindered? And I looked up the word hindered. It just said this, delayed or obstructed. That when you and your spouse aren't right, spiritually, your prayers are obstructed. You need to make that right. So how do we wrap all this up? To me, I, I want to close it out this way. Number one, marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. So if you're not part of the bride of Christ, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you don't have that relationship with him, that's the starting point today. The starting point is that you know him as Savior. And after the service, I'll be in the lobby, our staff will be down here, and uh, you'll see them at the doors and all. If you have that question, we want to talk to you about that because that's critically important. But then the other thing I would encourage you on today is this. Marriage is under attack. There's no doubt about it. The world is changing. I gave you illustrations that started in 2008, 15 years to show you what's happened. It's getting worse, and it's continual. As Christ followers pray for families because the family is under attack. Marriage is under attack. It's not to be redefined. God defined it. God designed it. So how about you? How's your marriage doing? You say, preacher, I'm not married. You've got a relationship with God. I, I, I love it. We had a visit with somebody yesterday who, uh, through divorce, is single again, and she made this comment. She said, God is my husband. And I thought, what a great illustration. That's who she looks for as her protector, her provider, her partner in life. And I thought that's such a great illustration. So all of us today at least have God right there as, as that person to protect us. But for those that are in the room this morning, I want to invite you, and I'm going to ask Pastor Robert to come, throw him a curveball here. He's, he may be have gone to lunch. Did he leave for lunch? <laughs> no. Jennifer said you gave him a hard time last week. I did. I love that guy. <laughs> I just got to tell you, Robert is like my right arm. And uh, I just, I love having him here. We got such a great team. And in that, if he's somewhere in the building, if not, I'm going to sing. So that'll get him running. <laughs> but here's what I like to do. There he is. Just came back in. Put your coffee down. Come on in. <laughs> All right. I'm just, I'm messing with him. He knows that. Hey, I want to, I want to give an invitation. We haven't done this in a long time. And, um, and in a moment, here's what I like to do. I just want to close out this part of our service in a way that we haven't done in a very long time because everybody's afraid of COVID and all that. But I want to invite couples to either kneel where you are or to come to the altar this morning and just to, to pray together. You say, Richard, you don't understand this. We had a big fight on the way to church. Well, then this is exactly the time to make it right, okay? Others of you are going, well, my spouse isn't here. We'll pray for your spouse. Others of you, maybe your, your spouse is, maybe, maybe you're single. You've never been married. Maybe you've been through a divorce. You pray. Pray that for these marriages around you. Those of you that have children, pray for the marriages of your children. But I want to take a minute this morning realizing that marriage is under attack. And I want to pray for marriages. And I want to invite you to pray for yours as others who aren't married may be praying for those around us. And pray for your children and their marriages. All right, and my wife's back there. I'm going to ask her, and I know she hates this too, but I'm going to ask her to join me, and we're going to pray together up here. And I want to invite you to join us and, and just pray. So can we all stand together to make it easy for folks to get out of the pews and just want to take a moment, invite you to come.
invite you to pray with your spouse or do it right there in the pews, whatever's best for you. And then I'll close this in prayer and then we'll wrap up our service, okay? So feel free, make your way across the altar, across these front pews, wherever's best for you. for your protection. Marriage is under attack. And Lord, we don't want to be a hateful or hurtful church, but we want to be an honest church. And if we avoid the subject and just try to fit in and be comfortable, the reality is that we're going to let the truth slip by us. And God, we can't do that. So based on your word this morning, marriage is your idea. It's your design. And so these families that are here and kneeling and those that have returned to their seats, Lord, I just pray over those couples this morning that you would protect these families. Father, for those that have been touched by divorce, I pray that you would heal their heart, that you would just give them a really strong uh, relationship with you. Should you choose to bring someone in their life, Lord, direct them only to date a believer, to follow as, as to what your biblical guidelines are. For those that have had a spouse that's already in heaven, Lord, comfort their heart. God, for those of us who have children that are married, we pray for those marriages today that you would just continue to bless and strengthen them, protect them. And God, may this church be a place of hope and healing when it comes to pointing people into a relationship that would honor you and look like the one that you designed. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.